Morning. <laughs> Good to see you. I've got a table here. This was unusual. Um, it's unusual for me too. I don't usually require a table to do what I want to do, but I, want, I just want to start something. Is that fine to click on the first slide? Does it work? Okay, cool. We're good. All right. Um, good morning. If you don't know me, I'm John's son. It seems to be that I get to preach sometimes when he's away. Um, I guess I'm not really sure that that's because he didn't like my preaching or just, uh, I don't know. I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, but um, I, I do enjoy my dad. We have a fun time together. Um, have you ever heard this phrase, uh, drink the Kool-Aid? Um, you, most of you will probably know where I believe it comes from. Some of you just, you've caught it along the way. The idea of drink the Kool-Aid is essentially, are you just going to blindly follow people, right? Are you just going to go into something, drink the Kool-Aid? And it comes uh, from a particular story in history. Most of you are going to know that, but some of you may not. Some of you may have just picked up that saying along the way, and I'll, I'll leave you there. But growing up in the States, at least until the age of 10, this thing Kool-Aid was really popular. It's just a, it's, it's a little bit different than um, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit different than what we would do in Australia with um, some other, other things that we mix up. But uh, it's, it's a powder form, and you put a packet like that. This says tropical punch. Then you put like every good thing in America, a whole cup of sugar. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Now that is a lot less, yes, that is a lot less sugar than Coke or something, right? You know, and then you fill up the whole thing. Um, and I don't know if I had that much water, but ideally, that's a little bit too thick, but ideally you have um, the whole thing all the way and, and, and you mix it up. Um, and then you, yes, you drink this stuff. Particularly as a kid, you drink this stuff. Um, and it looks like that. Usually a little bit more water looks a little bit more diluted, things like that. But it's, you know, so it's a lot more sugar than, let's say, cordial, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> a whole lot less. Or, or, yeah. So, um, but drink the Kool-Aid, okay? Um, and, and this is this idea. But in the States, they had this thing uh, called uh, dipping in the Kool-Aid, and, and the two are different. The drink the Kool-Aid comes from, um, you know, this one. Uh, that may work. Oh, you, you can go ahead to the next one. I don't know if, the, oh, there we go. Yeah, drink the Kool-Aid. This comes from um, this scene. You may have seen it, you may have forget about it. Um, but uh, in Guyana, um, next to Venezuela in South America, um, this is the Jonestown Massacre. So 900 plus people die, they drink the Flavor-Aid, not because Kool-Aid would tell you it wasn't their brand, it was called Flavor-Aid, mixed with cyanide and all this other stuff. And these people followed one man into mass, like, suicide. Um, and, and if you follow the story of the man Jim Jones, it's an interesting story of a man that got confused along the way and he starts as a, really he starts as a pastor. Um, and then he's kicked out of his own church, and then he starts his, or a church, and then he starts his own church called the Temples, uh, the People's Temple, right? It's in, in, in Indianapolis. They eventually moved to San Francisco. Then they spread out all the way through California. And then he has all these different ideas that seep in through his history. Uh, ideas from Marx or Lenin are these ideas that come in, communist ideas, and he mixed those in with all the different things that are in the church. And then he decides that the U.S. is um, persecuting him, so he moves him and a whole group of people to this South American uh, country, and they get a whole huge compound, 300,000 300, 300, acres, something like that, so it was large. Um, and then people move there and they join him from the States and they join him from South America and they come to live there in this, what he considered a utopia place. Like just, it was gonna be perfect. And they would share everything and eventually he would adopt even all the kids and it was a wild ride and um, it started okay and then it got worse and worse and worse. He wouldn't let people live and there was armed guards all around. And as uh, persecution was coming in and they were about to just get rid of this guy, um, he follows this one night where he gets them all to drink this uh, concoction mixed with cyanide. Um, and 
the one thing we don't really talk about often is a third of the people were kids. Um, wild, several people didn't want to drink the drink, so um, they were injected with it. Few people escaped something like this. It's wild, and so we use this phrase quite, quite um, uh, pretty easy, right? Like to, to drink the Kool Aid, but really, um, the next one says, says this: says to dip in the Kool Aid. That's sadness. That, that's a wild thing. We use it pretty lightly to follow into something like that. But to drink, to dip in the Kool Aid. Now, the dip in the Kool Aid was different, because if you don't mix Kool Aid, you don't understand. But in the States, when you dip in the Kool-Aid, like if you mix Kool-Aid, especially red Kool-Aid like this, you naturally get it on your hands. It stays with you. Um, uh, and so dipping in the Kool-Aid is like if you've ever had children that love to just put their head in a conversation, but they're not even really sure what they bought into. <laughs> and some people that were there at Jonestown, they were just dipping. They didn't even really know what was going on. Some people knew very well what was going on. Um, to, to, to dip in the Kool-Aid. Um, the saying goes like this, and you can look on YouTube video clips. They use it in popular shows in the States and things. And it may be lost on you, but now you know what it means. It means to butt into a conversation when you don't really know the full meaning of it. So kids do this often. Um, but I think, uh, like, I even saw a recent conversation where Joe Biden used it. They used it in commercials, all sorts of things. Um, to dip in the Kool-Aid when you don't even know the flavor. That's the whole saying. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting saying. I think it's a neat, and it, and it bodes something for us today. You think I'm crazy. This was a crazy story to kind of start the sermon. And where, where is he going? I'm actually going to take you quite heavily into the Bible today. Um, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot in there. And I got really excited about doing this um, the last few weeks. And so I'm going to go into a lot of places. Is that okay? I've got it all on the screen. Um, but I'm going to go to a bunch of different places. Um, usually I like to stay in one text, um, but I promise it's, got, it's, it's following through s- something. Um, and, and so I want to focus on a character, the character of James and John. Um, you know, I love, like early on, this, this is what uh, Luke says. So when um, the first disciples when Jesus is getting his disciples to come follow him. So the very few first disciples are Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James and John. They're the first ones. You know, they're the original. Uh, so when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those who were with him were amazed at the catch of the fish. Remember, he, he takes them out on a little bit of a fishing expedition. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. And then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. From Matthew's gospel, we know that Andrew was also there, and they were brothers. But it puts them all together, all in the same place. These are the very first people that follow Jesus. It's interesting that Peter... James, John, Andrew. If you drop Andrew, those are the three that are considered like the inner three. And they're the first three that follow Jesus. James, John, Peter. They left everything and followed him. Um, I like like this next one. Um, Also, one of the the coolest stories in in the Bible, I think, I believe, is they go up to a mountaintop. Um, James, John, Jesus... And Peter, right? Um, and a cloud appears. Um, Jesus' face shines bright. And God talks to them. And there's Moses and Elijah that appear. You've heard the story, right? Yeah, the transfigura- transfiguration. Wild story. Um, and, and, I always, you know, and here it's like when God speaks, he says, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. This is Jesus. And immediately the three get down and they worship him. It's, it's, it's a wild story. Maybe it's where, I don't know, because we don't really know where this uh, story. Uh, Jesus had a, uh, had a nickname for James and John. They were called the sons of thunder. So either it comes from this story 
because they just they, they were dumbfounded this idea that they were the sons of thunder. Or it comes from a story where they want um, where they want Jesus to put fire on their enemies or things like that. So the thun, sons of thunder that's what they're called. So they followed Jesus. These were special people, actually extremely really close to G, uh, Jesus. We're going to follow James and John, not Peter which is unusual, but I want to follow James and John. This is what it says in Matthew. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. See, Zebedee was the dad in the fishing boat. And now this is Zebedee's, this is the mother of Zebedee's sons. So approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? This is Jesus. He asked her, um, promise, she said to him, that the, these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right and um, the other at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered her. She, he says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink? And then James and John pipe up. They say, we are able. We're able. We can do this. To which Jesus says, yeah, you actually will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not for me to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. See, when I look deeper into the text and we look at history and we see this character, you know, um, Salome, we believe, um, Zebedee's wife, and she comes and asks, um, we believe she's the half sister, of, the half sister of Mary. And if that's true, then this is possibly, possibly, from what all the things that we see, all the connections that we try to make in the Bible, this is the aunt, Jesus' aunt, Auntie Salome, coming and saying, "Hey, um, can you grant my boys to sit on either side of you? They've been with you from the beginning." Can, I, can you put them on left and right hand side? Now, of course, you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story is everyone goes, you know, all the disciples are going, bah, bah, bah. They, get, they get into a, uh, a, a topsy turvy spin. They're, they're, they're upset at this that they even had the audaciousness to like come to um, Jesus and ask for this special prominent place. See, in, it, it's, it's lost on us, but to sit on the left and the right hand side, we understand was a position of prominence, right first and then left to sit on the table with him. And so she gets in early and makes this, I think really a lot of the disciples are probably just upset because they didn't think about it first. Uh, if I'm, I don't know that, I don't read that. I'm just, I'm just looking into this, but, but can you imagine, you know, like it's the same sort of scene when Jesus is there with his mother and says, hey, what do you want me to do with that we don't have any wine? <laughs> but it's this idea that she comes and she says, hey, Hey, can you grant these boys? But the interesting thought about the story, we often focus on, oh, these guys are so, you know, they're just trying to get them to sit in the right spots. But I like the first part that is almost forgotten. Are you able to drink the cup? They said, they piped up, we are able. This was no small feat. This was an act of extreme obedience. We are able. And in fact, Jesus shoots ahead in time and says, yeah, you are. You are. If you follow along where James dies is interesting. And we, we easily gloss over this, but the beginning of uh, Acts chapter 12 says this. At about that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church. And he executed James. This is the same line of Herods that had done things a lot. Of, you know, it's not the same one that killed John the Baptist, but it, but it is the same line of Herods. The ones that asked this, it is the same line that asked for the babies that under the age of two to be killed. This is the same line of Herods. So the wicked men. About that time, they executed James, John's brother, with sword. And then if you follow along that, that, that part of Scripture, 
we focus on Peter, but Peter got out and there was the ghost and he's in jail and all this stuff. But we often forget about James right here at the beginning of the text because it doesn't say anything about him. He was executed. His head was cut off. James was the very first disciple that is martyred. If you look at the disciples and all the different uh, people that followed Jesus, the first to die is Judas. You can say his name, I know. You know, like, you know, uh, Judas, all right, killed himself. The next 10 that die, die for the name of Jesus. They're martyred in some way. We know this from either the Bible or we knew it, know it from history. Historians, both Christian historians and non-Christian historians declare that all these people that didn't die. Do you know the person who doesn't die? Well, yes, Jesus. But the disciples, it's John. So James dies first, a martyr's death. John doesn't die. I don't know about you and I, but as friends, if you have a spouse, you understand this. You may have said this, I hope we could die pretty close together so we don't have to have a long time apart or, or whatever this looks like. And James and John, James dies early, John dies late. And John continues to do things for Jesus over and over again. In fact, we're lucky that we have the story of John because if you follow all the way to Revelation, this is what happens in Revelation chapter 1. John writes Revelation, right? As well as some letters and different things. I, John, your brother and partner in affliction, because he had been afflicted. If you read through John's stories, he certainly had kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus. I was on the island called Patmos. Now today people go to Patmos to vacation. It's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous Greek island that still exists, and yes, you can go there, and it's still called Patmos. That looks pretty pretty. I actually chose one of the less endearing photos, believe it or not, because um, it shows that people are doing some work. But back in the day, in Bible times, the island of Patmos, they would send people to mine it. Romans would occupy it, and they'd send them to Patmos. It wasn't a good deal. John, uh, John goes to Patmos, he's exiled. And the only reason he's exiled is because of this. This is a funny thing. They tried to kill him. They threw him in a, in a vat of boiling oil, is what the historian says. That's what, that's what we read And Eusebius. This is what the historian says. He says, and he didn't die. Well, I mean, that kind of goes with other things in Scripture we hear about what they've tried to kill Christians along the way and people that followed Jesus. But he didn't die. So it's like, what are we going to do with this guy? So they sent him out here. And for 18 months under um, Caesar Domitian, the last Caesar, they put him to the island of Patmos. Um... And for 18 months, he stays there. He only gets out because the next emperor takes over. Nerva gets him out and says, all right, you can come back now. Uh, but also the wild thing is this. He writes the book of Revelation that God gives us at the end, the ending book on the island of Patmos. We believe he's like 90 years old. So think, 90 years old, mining. That doesn't really sit well with me. That's, that's well into early retirement age, right? All right. And so he's here, he's, he's here, and, and he's on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He got there because he just kept saying the name of Jesus. So you got James and you got John, the closest of the two. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet say, write on a scroll what you see and then send it to the seven churches. If it's, I don't know if it's lost on you or not, but six of the churches are the ones that um, he actually helped start. The seventh was Ephesus and it was the one that Paul started. So he writes to the seven churches. John was instrumental in the beginnings of these churches and some things had gone awry. Some things were not right. Some things were wrong. But he writes to these churches, um, are you able to drink my cup? We are. 
I don't think they were lying. And I think Jesus shoots to his head and he knows the exact moment how James died and was killed and he knows the exact plight of John. Everything that he would do for him in history and even all the way up into the exile at Patmos. He knew immediately when they said, we are, we're all in, we're able to do this, we are able to drink this cup. He knew, yep, you are. Isn't that wild? In that moment, he thinks years in advance and says, yep, you are. You are able. See, Jesus knows the outcome every single time. Jesus knows the outcome. We forget that in our life, that Jesus knows the outcome. This is, um, uh, that is, um, it does, yeah, Jesus knows the outcome. This is true. Every single time, Jesus knows the narrative. He knows what is going to happen. He knew that how James would die. He knew how John would die. We don't even really have a record of really how John died. We just hear all the things he said from his history and different things in, in, in the Bible. But we don't actually know exactly how he passed. Jesus knows the outcome. If you pick up in Matthew, this is one of my favorite texts. It's the beautiful text where... Um, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And Jesus, it's right before, his, right before he's gonna be arrested. You know, uh, Judas had deserted him. He sold him out for pieces of silver. And um, they go to the garden to pray. Who does he take with him? James, John, and Peter. His inner three, the same three that were at the transfiguration, the same thing that he, you know, one of them he was said in scripture that he was, he was the beloved. James, John, Peter. Peter, he says, I'm gonna build my church. You're my rock. I'm gonna build the church upon you, right? And James, he's the first one that dies a martyr death and we often forget about him, poor James, because he was one of the inner three. And he was the first disciple that says, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? He says, yes. And he lost his head because of it. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew says this, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he told the disciples, hey, sit here while I go over and pray. Uh, taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, the sons of thunder, the original thunderstruck twins, um, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said, and he said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he fell down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. He continues to go. Uh, picking up in 40. Uh, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, so you couldn't stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, a second time he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. Now, the disciples fall asleep three times. You know the story there. But I, I, I like this, like, this is a weird discourse in the Bible. This is one I wrestle with. Like, what, Jesus gets down and he prays and he prays to God. He says, hey, if it's possible, may it not have to be this way. Wild, especially when you consider that Jesus, God, the Father, wild thought. But yet, I believe Jesus knew it, it was the only way. But I, I think this inner turmoil that he goes through in this, he's about to bear the sins of the whole of humanity, of all existence, of all time. And he says, if it's possible, could it be any other way? Wild thought. Rest, how, how, how does this take place? But I think... Equally, Jesus knew this is the only way it could happen. That's 
That's, that's, that's wild. That's an interesting thought. He's, and he's playing, take this, let this cup pass from me. This cup. Um, the same, I, in, in, in the same way, it was what the cup is used as, you know, as a reference of what he would have to endure. And when he uses it before to James and John, he says, are you able to take the cup? He says, yes, we are able to endure the same cup. Not, not necessarily, they didn't have to be crucified, but we're able to endure the same kind of persecution and suffering that you have. They knew what it meant. And we just gloss over it in that story. They said, we are able. We focus on why they're so selfish. One of the things we should understand is, at the same time, they are the people that follow Jesus in life and in death. We are able. Jesus sits there and he says, man, and he's just praying a simple prayer and they can't even stay awake for an hour and they fall asleep three different times. Um, you know, Jesus even knew his outcome. He knows our outcome. He knew his outcome. But I think at that point, it was heavy. And remember, he's all human here. <laughs> and it's heavy. It was a big weight. It was entering Jesus' story. Jesus knew the outcome. In fact, he knew this outcome from the beginning as he walked as a human, as he lived. I don't picture him in the crib as a baby thinking about this. But I think as he gets closer and closer to this point in his story, the conclusion of the ministry of Jesus as we, we know it, the, before he's crucified at least, he knew what was about to take place. He knew that that wasn't the end of the story even for crucifixion, but he knew that was a tough part. To sit there, to be killed in the worst way known at that time. Um, to be crucified, it's still, it's still to today, it would, be a, it, would be, it would be right up there with the worst tortures of all time. To be killed like that. Jesus knew the outcome. The question for you today is, are you sipping or are you dipping? <laughs> are you sipping or are you dipping? I, have you actually taken the cup upon yourself and are you able to, willing to endure the persecution that inevitably you will face if you choose to actually say, I am a follower in every aspect of your life? Or are you around putting your head in conversation but not really following. And you may be the only one that can know if you're really dipping. Your friends may not even be able to call you out. Are you able to take the cup? Interesting and quite confronting picture with a man holding a gun is like if the, the fact that if someone was to point a gun at your head and say, hey, look, in front of your family, are you a Christ follower? We've seen this through history with different things. We see it even sometimes now of what somebody would follow. They say, are you a Jew or not, right? Like this concept, are you a Christian? You say, yes, that's a big deal, all right? Are you sipping or are you dipping? Um, only you may know. You may take the cup on communion, and I think you should if you are really able to endure, if you are a true believer, but it's so much more than that. You, will not, you realize when you said yes to Jesus, it meant in life and in death. It meant in persecution. It meant in trials. It meant in uh, uh, when things aren't all the best. Uh, I wonder if someone were to survey your life after you died, a random person. Maybe they had, let's say they have access to your phone. We use these things for quite some things right now, right? And they had access to your bank accounts. Based on your bank accounts, would they understand that you're a follower of Jesus? Could they interpret that? Would they know it? If they were to look at your daily calendar, would they understand that you're a follower of Jesus? If they would look deep into your text message history, would they understand that you 
You walk the walk, talk the talk. Or would they see a farce? Or perhaps if they would search of what were your most frequently searched things on the interwebs, would they recognize that you're a follower? They would understand, I really like basketball a lot based on my inner, you know, net searches. And they would understand that I follow a team quite a lot, right? But would they place that of more importance of looking through my history than something else? An interesting thought. And I don't know the answer for you. Just thought it was a wild one. As we continue to follow, I, I told you a lot about it. I told you I was going into a lot of scripture. Is this okay? Uh, like, I like scripture, and when I get excited about scripture, and I go like, oh, this, and, um, you know, scripture's been around for a long time, so chances are I've made, this, I've made these jumps, and others have made it along the way, too. <laughs> you know, right? This, this is nothing new, but it is, I think, I hope it could speak something to you today. Like, because I like God's word, and when you're excited about the in- intricate places that it takes you, it's really cool. Matthew 16 goes back, and, and we're, we are getting closer, um, Matthew 16, Jesus said this to his disciples. You know this because this is famous. This is a good part of scripture. They're all good parts, I guess. Some are hard parts, (laughs) but they're all all good parts. Uh, Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever who wants to save his life, his or her life, will lose it, but whoever will lose his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. He roared each according to what he's done. Or how about this in Revelation? Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. This is written to the church at Smyrna, so we can't really take the same thing, but the concept's the same. Be, John says, be faithful to the point of death. He's speaking for Jesus in in Jesus' words because Jesus appears to him on the island of Patmos. He says, and I will give you the crown of life. Crown and reward, um, those are things that are promised to us. But there's there's a right way to position yourself here. There's a right way and there's a wrong way, I, I believe. The wrong way is like a kid at Christmas. What will I get from this? You know, it's when we promise our kids, and I probably just did it here. It's like, hey, oi, oi, behave. <laughs> Remember, we said, be good. Otherwise, someone won't come see you at Christmas. You know, <laughs> even me. It's just built, but this crown, this reward. But this is where I think, and it's a little bit challenging to see, but I think it's worthy to actually place in your brain. We follow the long and winding road. Why do we do this? We follow the long and winding road not for the reward, but it's nice to be reminded of the return. There's a crown there when the ride gets rough. There's an interesting position that I think is a is a fair position. We follow the long and winding road, the 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 road, the following, picking up, denying self, picking up your cross daily, following him, coming to church weekly, whatever this deal, this long and the winding road. Sometimes when it's tough to still follow Jesus, we follow the long and winding road, not for the reward. If we have the reward in our mind all the time, like that it's the only thing we're following Jesus for, you've got the, you've got the idea wrong. It's there. It's been promised in Scripture. But I think sometimes it is nice to be reminded that there is a return 
on your investment. There will be a crown. There will be a reward. Those that have followed, those that have remained true. And that's really helpful to remember, especially in times of turmoil, especially when the road gets tough, to remember the reward that is found in Jesus in the future, but also in the present. The crown that is promised. I don't know how I would look with the crown, give it to the person next to me, but I do want to sit with everyone who's there. I think that's where you need to be. You, you understand that? Does that make sense? It's the idea is so excited about the present that you unwrapped that you're peeking or you're shaking it all the time. Or understanding that Christmas is going to come and I'm excited because it's just, it's a good season. <laughs> um, the greatest Christmas we can ever experience is heaven, being present with Christ. That's gonna be awesome. Best present ever, the best reward ever. When the long and winding road ceases, says this, these are promises in scripture. I think they're helpful to remember and to put them on your, um, I don't know, put them on your diaries, make sure they come up often in your history. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He actually promises, he says, buckle up. It's going to be a difficult ride. That's what Paul says to Timothy. Paul was a little bit wiser. He had been here a little bit longer, right? And he says, buckle up. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Anyone that tells you opposite, just that you follow Christ and everything good comes your way, I question their theology. Or, you know, like it, it, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, sure, there are times of absolute filling and absolute joy in Christ, but there are times that there will be persecution. And we don't even understand the same kind of persecution, but perhaps we're entering an age in Australian history where we will be persecuted more than certainly the last 100 years. I actually think that. Because of what we, leave, what we say, what, we, what our values are, they're gonna be different than others. John, uh, it says this in Gospel of John, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, suffering. You will have suffering. There's gonna be times that it's gonna be hard. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Take heart. I have conquered the world is what other, I like that better almost, take heart. I have conquered the world. You know, Jesus knows your outcome. He knows his outcome. The cool thing is that Jesus wins. That's the cool thing. Jesus wins. Um, he has conquered. Jesus has the victory. Jesus wins. The question is, do you? Do you? We gotta be careful who we listen to. Because you can end up like these people that all drunk the Kool-Aid. But there's one person that is worth following and taking his cup and actually drinking it for yourself. You can't take that back. Once you've drunk the drink, it, it, it has been drunk. But you... This is gonna be way too much sugar for me. I know, all, I know all of you are thinking it, but they meant they were able to endure. Let me encourage you today. If you've been enduring persecution or suffering or of any sorts with your family, your friends, your workplace, whatever it looks like, take heart, be courageous. I have conquered the world. 
understand that there's a reward waiting for you, right? But in the same breath, we don't work for the reward, but we walk along the difficult world. It's just important to remember it when time gets tough, I think. That's my thought. The story of James and John. James is often forgotten. (laughs) Will there come a time where Christians are persecuted actually even to death in Australia? I don't know. I know around the world, if you look hard enough, there are stories every single day of people that die for Jesus. Actually, by the hour, people are dying. What are we going to do in this life? What is he going to do? Are we going to show them that we are just a follower of Jesus on Sunday-ish? Or is it every aspect of our life? If I was to pass today, would my kid understand who I followed? We pray. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. Thank you that we get to learn much about you and your word. God, I know many here are followers of you. But if there is anyone that is maybe not really sure, would they talk to someone? Not really sure if they've taken this cup. Not really sure if they would take Jesus unto death. Would they be challenged today? God, would I be changed and transformed by your word today? Would we see you anew again in your kingdom? God, we love you. Look after little ones. In Jesus' name, amen.